Yeah, my name is Eric Weidenhammer. I'm interviewing uh, Chris Twigmalsi, and uh, we may as well just uh, begin. So maybe we'll just start as we did before with your with your name and age. Okay, it's Chris Twigmalsi. I'm 68 years old. Where were you born? I was born in Bromley in the UK. That's a suburb of London, essentially. Grew up in London. What did your parents do? My mother was a university lecturer in the history of drama. And my father and stepfather were both journalists, so it's kind of a literary background. What did you do as a child to pass the time? Uh, well, depending on phase, I guess um, I was always very much into sports and did a lot of outdoor activities as one could in, in London, living close to the big Hampstead Heath as I did. And, uh, I did a lot of things, played with Macondo a lot, which I, it's still around amazingly enough, but it's uh, essentially a mechanical toy that encourages you to build all kinds of machines to go up and down. And it's, it's good for kids' dexterity as well as uh, encouraging building stuff. So you had an early interest in engineering, would you consider that? No, not really. Not really. My engineering interest came by accident much later. When I was applying for the scholarship to Oxford and Cambridge in high school, um, <clears throat> doing the classical maths, physics, and chemistry, and uh, they just introduced an engineering exam rather than just the classical uh, courses, and it looked a lot uh, more interesting to me than certainly the chemistry. So that's what I chose to do, and uh, was accepted in the engineering school at uh, Cambridge. So how about your early uh, education? Where did you go to school and uh, what classes did you enjoy when you were there? Uh, I went to a local prep school in North London and then went to a boarding school down in the West Country called Rundles that's uh, not particularly good known in West London recently. But it was a very solid school and uh, had some very rigorous teaching, particularly around mathematics and physics. And uh, I really enjoyed the physics. I found it fascinating. Of course, with uh, strong training in math, one could really get into it quite seriously. So what did you choose uh, to study aeronautical engineering at, at Cambridge? Uh, well, the way the Cambridge system works is the first degree or the, is called a mechanical sciences tripos, and it's pretty broad um, across all the disciplines in engineering. And then um, if you're part two, which is I, I chose to take, um, it, you've got very specialized options, and I'd always loved airplanes, and it was a no-brainer to me. Now, plus, it was a very small group of us did the part two. There were only six of us in the whole lot. So we really got some pretty interesting attention. Uh, was there a, a relationship between your education in aeronautical engineering and your later specialization in fluid mechanics? Well, they were really one and the same. <coughs> um, the course was actually aer aerodynamics and aeronautics. So, uh, and the aerodynamics is fluid mechanics by any other name. And it's a specialized sector of it, but the underlying equations are all the same. The discipline is pretty much the same. So, um, fluid mechanics really was what I did when I came here to the University of Toronto. So, how and when did you become interested in metallurgy? Uh, that's kind of an accident. Um, the fluid mechanics and some of the things I did actually on contract while I was a postgraduate student here at the University, uh, at the University of Toronto, um, were for a company called Hatch. And um, I guess at that time they were expanding and looking for young people full of vim and vigor. So um, I was hired into Hatch, really not knowing very much about what they did. I wound up in initially doing a lot of work in dispersion modeling. They just built a super stack up at Inco. So several of the copper smelters were looking at building super stacks. And there was all kinds of uh, gas cleaning and cleanup, environmental work being done on the gas side in particular. So I spent several years in that end of the business. And that was attached to metallurgy. And over the years, I started getting into the flow of liquid metals and heat transfer inside the processes. So 
I, I sort of came into metallurgy backwards. But don't ask me about the chemistry. I have no idea. How did you find your education at the University of Toronto? It was extremely good. It was very, very, very rigorous. Um, some of the coursework was pretty, pretty tough. Um, but uh, the, the quality of people we had around us, uh, and this was in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in those days, was absolutely outstanding. And uh, I certainly could never fault the education that they drove into me. And they got me out of here in four years, which for a PhD in those days was pretty good. There were a lot of folks hanging around for seven. Can you describe uh, how you first came to Hatch? Uh, do you remember your first day on the, on the job? I came to Hatch, as I indicated earlier, through uh, doing some consulting for them. But it, uh, also, uh, one of the principals of Hatch at the time was next door neighbor to my supervisor, Doug Baines. In fact, brought me from Cambridge in the first place. Uh, so uh, that got me the interview, which I think is probably the most important part of getting through the door. Um, in terms of my first day, yeah, it was rather, rather sobering. Um, I was introduced to my ultimate supervisor, a man called John Good, who was a very functional. And he looked at me thoughtfully across the table and he said, Chris, your transcript's pretty good, but from now on I want 100% which of course I was a little alarmed, and then he said the good news is there's a whole team of us here to help you get there. So it was, it was a memorable moment, and I remember this was uh, 45 years later. Can you describe what the company was like when you first joined? When I first joined, there were 300 people. Uh, everybody knew everybody, it was uh, like a big family in many ways. Um, when I stopped working full-time, we were somewhere around 11,000, which is a pretty big expansion over a period. And I think one of the things that uh, changes is when you go from small to big, uh, you get into a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of systems, and, and you have to have it. I mean, I'm not arguing about that at all, but it's a pretty dramatic change in, in how you do stuff and how you get access to people the other knowledge that's around you. And of course, we went global as well, which meant that there were all kinds of strengths within the company that I didn't even know existed, and uh, it's not always easy to find. So how is research done at an engineering company uh, as compared to what's done at a university or a government lab? I can only speak for how we do it at Hatch. Um, I have no idea how the companies do it, even if they do. But basically, in the consulting engineering field um, that we have, we have a lot of people working in the plants of our clients. So we're aware of the real problems and the real challenges that they're facing. So that's our starting point uh, with a real problem, not with something that we dream up in the bubble. The Then the next step is internally, um, if somebody comes up with a solution, a potential solution, we will spend a bit of money doing a proof of concept just to make sure that the approach that's been thought about makes sense. And we spend our own money. Sometimes we get a little bit of money, some support from uh, insert or somebody. But uh, that's really secondary. The, the key then is we have enough confidence in what we're doing to go back to our clients and saying, are you willing to develop this with us? And uh, some say yes, some say no. But if we have a whole lot of clients say no, then we know it's not a good idea. If uh, all we need is one to say yes, and then not only do you develop a project for them, uh, which solves a problem for them, but you have a first full-scale demonstration that you can show other people as well, which in a field like metallurgy, which is highly capital intensive, you have a huge race to be second very reluctant to take the risk, unfortunately, of developing something themselves. So to be able to take people to a full-scale operating facility to demonstrate the technology is hugely important. So that's the model that we've used, uh, I'd say, well, pretty well for 50 years. So what's your relationship, say, to, uh, to the research that's done in the university or, or in government labs? Is, do, do, is a lot of the pure research uh, that you then apply come from, come from elsewhere? Or? 
Yes, although um, when Jerry Hatch founded the company, one of his mentors was Bridget McGann because he was a PhD re researcher who then went into operations and realized that the skills the operators needed to solve their problems came as much from research as they did from anything else. And the engineering was just interpreting one to support the other. Um, so Hatch evolved in really interesting ways. At one point, and I'm not sure where we are as, as I sit here today, but um, some years ago we had 300 PhDs in the company, which is more than many in the engineering departments. A lot more. Um, which meant that we were able to interpret what's going on, but also to use fundamentals to develop our own approaches to things. And uh, going back to your original question, yes, we're very close to certainly the government labs. Um, we use the commercial labs to do actual testing and test work for us. Uh, we've often used university facilities for test work, but that doesn't work so well sometimes because uh, there are different time scales in the university sometimes. But um, we do support uh, chairs at several universities across the country. And the ones I'm aware of as we speak here in Canada, in McMaster, um, Toronto, and um, UBC. And there may well be one of Queens, I forget. But the, the key is that uh, we believe very strongly in the fact that you have to develop talent to support our industry. And the students that come out from the crops don't necessarily come to us, but they're in the business, and that's pretty cool. Uh, plus, we do get sponsored research done uh, by, by those profs on occasions. And they come and they give us lectures. It's cool. Are certain industries uh, more accepting or open to innovation than others, say uh, uh, ferrous versus non-ferrous or industries in different countries? Um, non-ferrous is much more open to innovation than ferrous because the ferrous industry is pretty well supported technologically by the suppliers, not by the operating companies. Where in the non-ferrous industry, it, every plant is different. And they're all custom plants. And as a result, there's much higher engineering content required in these kinds of plants. And uh, as a result, you, you get a different uh, caliber of uh, metallurgical In terms of material science, you probably find more strength in the steel companies. Um, but you know, I now get very specific to which kind of metals you're talking about. Mm -hmm. At what point did Hatch begin working uh, overseas? Uh, in the late 60s, Falkenbridge looked at developing a large laterite deposit in the Dominican Republic. And so we essentially went overseas to the Dominican Republic under Falkenberg's wing. And that project lasted through till the mid-70s, at which point uh, Quebec and Titanium were developing a large smelting complex in South Africa. So in a similar vein, we then went to South Africa under uh, their wing. So those were the two sort of big steps out. But based on the experience we had, uh, we were then pretty comfortable working in South Africa in particular. One thing led to another, and by 1995, I guess, we were pretty well global. Did you notice important differences uh, between the Canadian work culture and the, and the culture at other uh, mining and engineering companies uh, overseas? Yes, but it depends where overseas. Um, I would say Canada, US, UK, Australia, uh, South Africa. Anywhere that sort of came under the, the British way of uh, engineering did things pretty much the same way. When you got into Russia, Kazakhstan, Chile, Peru, Brazil, China, all countries I've worked in, um, they tend to be much more top down. And so there is uh, much more uh, effort to make please the boss than there is to necessarily come up with the right answer. And that, that can cause a lot of difficulty sometimes. Now I'm overgeneralizing, but my experience has been that working in those cultures 
uh, takes a different kind of uh, understanding of what's going on if you want to understand the answers you're getting. So your impression is that there's a sort of Anglo-Saxon engineering tradition that's more dis that's particularly decentralized? Uh, it devolves the responsibility of the engineers. You know, when you do your arithmetic, you come up with an answer. That's what the answer is. And yeah, I, I guess it is the uh, Anglo-Saxon approach to put it that way. In an earlier interview, you mentioned uh, some of the challenges of working in the in the Russian steel uh, industry in the early '90s, which is, of course, a very interesting period. Uh, can you describe some of the circumstances and challenges? <laughs> well, there are two different kinds of challenges. Um, one I call infrastructure or logistics, and the other is culture. Um, the logistics one was just getting around was very hard. I mean, airplanes ran out of fuel and grounded until they figured out how to get some fuel. Um, hotels in some towns didn't exist. I mean, we, we went into some towns restructuring steel mills where the only accommodation was the changing rooms in the football stadium. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and that's okay. Um, but I developed a strategy of I, I would only take in teams of individuals who either liked camping or I knew did not whine because whiners were not welcome. So that's kind of the logistics infrastructure side. The, the culture side was a little different in that they were planning comp. Money, profit motive had absolutely nothing to do with anything they did. So one of the places where we were working uh, in Central Europe uh, had the floor plates in the mill shop made of uh, nine-inch stainless steel slabs. And so they were financing themselves by taking out the floor. I mean, it, that was quite different. The other thing that was quite different was that they had no idea why you needed a profit. And so we used to spend the evenings over hopefully beer, but unfortunately sometimes vodka, explaining why you actually had to have a profit in an operation if you wanted to grow more possible. And quite honestly, a lot of them just never got it. After working with them three or four years, they still really weren't comfy with the idea that it would make a profit. So there were very deep cultural divides. And in fact, at the time, we said there's going to be a generation before this changes. And we're more than a generation later now that still hasn't changed. Areas of the country. Technologically, where were the Soviet operations uh, when, when you arrived? They were really interesting technologies. Um, some of the steel mills, and I think Petsk in particular, had bought all the most modern uh, Western gear because they were making plates for the military, this kind of stuff. So they had the money to do it. The plants we were working in, the Europe's, were doing some really interesting metallurgical stuff but totally impractical in Western sense because it would have cost a fortune. But they were, um, for one thing, uh, for sour gas, they were making stainless steel line carbon steel pipe uh, by actually pouring a stainless core into a carbon pipe and then the filter mill punching the thing out into a, into a stainless line pipe. They're brilliant, but totally impossible to do in the West at that time. Oh, well, maybe we can do something now when somebody put the money to it. But it worked. It just neat stuff. How has the role of uh, metallurgical engineering companies changed over time? Uh, well, of course, the, if you go back 50 years, there really weren't any metallurgical engineering companies. You had what I call the wraparound companies who did the the major equipment suppliers, mostly out of the States and Germany, uh, supplied huge equipment packages, whether it was a blast furnace, a coke oven, or a package, whatever. Um, and the local companies here in Canada, whether it was Foco at the time or others, would do the wraparound engineering, the piping, the foundations, all that stuff, but nothing to do with the metallurgy. The metallurgy would either be done by the supplier or by the owner. Now, in some areas, and, and uranium was one, uh, there were a few one-man bands uh, who were doing metallurgical consulting, but they were very small groups. And uh, the one that comes to mind was A.H. Ross, for example. But um, then we go through a couple of cycles, and um, the big manufacturing companies, the 
particularly the states, it's essentially went out of business. So you wind up then with a wasteland, but a lot of unemployed engineers from the metallurgical sector, and they started aggregating into small companies. And then you have another downturn, and when, you go back, when, you first, when I first joined, ACO had a huge engineering group. Falkenbridge had a substantial one. Guggenheim had a substantial one. Stelco had a very big group. DeFasco had a very big group. And I mean, we're talking several hundreds or thousands. Uh, by the time we've been through the 80s downturn, the 90s downturn, they were all gone. And all those good, well-trained engineers had generally formed into consulting groups or joint existing consulting groups. So you now had a standalone metallurgical branded consulting activity. Now, of course, in truth, the metallurgical work was mostly simple supply patient structural and all the other stuff. The metallurgical component is, is fairly small. But um, really there was a complete change in the industry uh, to where we are now, where essentially the owners had very little strength. Um, the manufacturers now have very little strength. And what strength is left is in the engineering companies, and as we speak, they too are being decimated. So. Uh, the next, the next wave, when we turn up, I don't know where the people are going to come from to design and build the plants in Canada and the States for that matter. And when you go overseas, there are other pockets of strength, not around here, that's for sure. So overall, this <clears throat> transition from research and development of the mining companies to engineering companies has resulted in more or less a deficit of, of research and development in metallurgy? Well, we've got two different things here. We've got the research and development. Well, the engineering. Right. I've just been talking about the engineering. The R&D was kind of one of the early casualties, but we're now seeing a different squeeze on the R&D because pretty well all our major metallurgical companies, with the exception of a couple of gold companies and tech, are owned by foreigners. So when the squeeze comes, uh, a head office in Brazil or in Geneva or wherever, or US Steel in Pittsburgh, wherever it happens to be, they'll squeeze the locals here in Canada because uh, political things at home and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. Probably tax things, I don't know. And maybe we are high cost in the scheme of things. I, I don't think so, generally. But, uh, one way or another, um, being a branch plant economy, as we've become, is not a good thing. Can you describe the process of commissioning a plant and some of the challenges that are involved? Processes are, well really, when you come to commissioning, um, it's the culmination of sometimes five years of design activity, or procurement activity, and construction activity. Um, and for a design engineer, it's always a hugely satisfying time to be actually on the field and making stuff go. But really, it's a, a culmination of a planning exercise, a detailed planning exercise, a starting back in the early design phases of how are you going to start this thing up? What do you need first? You know? You need power, you need water, you need sewage, you need you know, places for people to, to change, all that kind of stuff, before you start anything up. So very detailed planning goes into this uh, before you get going. Once you get going, typically you start with equipment, it's a rotating the right way around, it's connected properly, it's a level, it's in line with everything else. So that's kind of mechanical stuff and uh, the basic safety checks. And then as you start integrating the equipment into systems, really the paramount thing is always safety because there's so many things can go wrong. If, you, if you're planning this off and you start something up, you start loading material into a bin with the gates closed or whatever, um, the opportunities for things to go wrong are real and constant. <clears throat> so you wind up with extremely complex tagging and lockout systems, and very detailed procedures. And it's all around making sure, A, that the startup is logical, uh, B, that you've got the resources you need, where you need it, when you need it, and ultimately to keep it safe. Um, and then once everything mechanically is running in an integrated way, and you've checked out the instrumentation and the readouts given meaningful numbers of things, then you can start feeding live feed into the system. And that gets to be very exciting. 
Can you think of any memorable instances of uh, plants that you've commissioned? I going back over the years, um, they're all exciting because it's your baby. You've designed it, you've done the underlying work, you may have done test work at some scale. Now you're pushing buttons and waiting for things to happen. So it's really exciting. But I, I think um, it's the difficult ones you tend to remember. Uh, the good ones are fun. Things work, you turn it over to the operators. Well, it is actually going to be turned over to the operators anyway at that stage. You're more an advisor at a later stage. You've actually got live feed on the thing. And a problem shooter. Problem shooter. But uh, you know, when the thing's working properly, that first billet comes out of that billet casting machine. Uh, that's just a wonderful moment. And then we'll head out and have a beer. I mean, that's the name of the game. But it's a team activity. Startup commission for any substantial part plant is a very complex team activity. And so when it works, you know, it's a team celebration for the first day. Can you describe your career at Hatch? Yeah. yeah. Um, I started in design of plants, uh, doing fairly specialized stuff, learning fluid mechanics, air dispersion model, uh, step calculations. I got into environmental permitting, um, and I guess uh, developed an acoustics group. As a result of that, over the first 10 years, I guess started developing my own client base, which in a consulting environment is kind of one of the key elements to moving forward. Unless you want to be a project manager or something, which I didn't particularly. Um, so after a while, but I guess by about 20 years into the game, I became vice president of uh, business development, which involved obviously developing stuff around the world. Um, and then I guess about 91, no, sorry, about 96, um, I, we. The board meeting, the board sat at the beginning of every January and had a discussion around what we're going to do this year. And because of my uh, business development role and my, my uh, interest in world affairs and things, I read a tremendous amount. And um, at that time, all the drone rigs from all over the world were heading for Chile. So I said to our chairman, Ron Nolan, at the time, I said, Ron, you know, all the drone rigs from Chile, and if you drill, you find stuff. Everywhere else, nobody's drilling, they're not going to find anything. So why not in Chile? And he looked at me thoughtfully and said, yes, Chris, why not in Chile? So off I went to Chile as uh, an operating role now to start developing my business in Chile. Um, and gave up on the corporate uh, development stuff. And it was, really, it was really an interesting time. And I'm very proud of the way Chile's evolved for us. Because I went down with a suitcase and set up in an office center where you share a coffee machine with a bunch of other folks. You share it with a secretary, you share it almost on the telephone. Um, and I guess 10 years later we had 1,200 people. So it was it was a real success story. Now we can't take credit for all of it, obviously, but sowing the seeds, getting the, getting the perception of what Hatch was all about into the marketplace was, was really, I think, the, the, the big success we had. So, uh, Chile. And from Chile, the Chile base, I started to see proceed in Peru. And then, um, for family reasons, actually, I decided I'd come back here. And the thing that I was asked to do was to build a technologies business unit within Hatch, where we would sell proprietary technologies, which includes things like the Stelco Coil Box that uh, we bought from Stelco back in the early 90s. <clears throat> and a range of other things that we've developed. Uh, so for the next couple of years, I was doing that, uh, putting together a global group, uh, selling proprietary technologies rather than engineering services. That uh, was a very interesting period. And during that period, we bought BHP engineering from BHP. And one of the things that they had was a small engineering group up in Shanghai that was delivering turnkey uh, sheds and equipment, like butler buildings, to sell steel um, into China. And when we bought them, that particular unit wasn't doing very well. So I was asked to go and see what we could do with them. Well, 
since then, the last 12 years, that's what I've been doing. I've been helping build a business in China, which actually has been very successful. <clears throat> and that's what I continue to do after I'm officially retired from the organization. Now you mentioned in passing your uh, your um, early work on fluid mechanics and, and smokestacks. Do you have an opinion on the super stack period when they were, when they were putting those up? Um, well, you know, it all comes back to what is the driving force. And the driving force for environmental cleanup, quite appropriately, in the early 70s was regulation. I mean, there were all kinds of messes all over the country. So, uh, more in the US than here. And of course, the EPA led the charge on developing science based regulations. <coughs> and uh, their choice of regulation was uh, basically you know, bound to put it on the product order. For whatever reason, Ontario decided to do ground level concentration. And so the logical way to get the ground level concentration down is to build a super stack. And that, in Inco's uh, analysis, I guess, was the most cost effective way of meeting the regulations. Um, it's subsequently led to some very interesting metallurgical improvements and things to actually, I think the super stack's probably totally redundant. Because the SO2 emissions are, are probably five percent of what they were in the early 70s, but um, that was the right solution at the time for that particular situation. Can you describe some of your um, some of your patents? Patents, okay. Um, well, one of them was a way to produce arsenic trioxide from uh, the frac of arsenic. Interestingly, by the time, well, there was a point at which half the world's arsenic trioxide was produced through that patent. Uh, you asked why would anybody produce arsenic trioxide? Well, in fact, we're all familiar with Green, Green London, which is CCA, corn, copper, arsenic. That's where the arsenic went. Um, and at the time, again, the EPA had ruled that CCA and creosote were both pretty ugly materials, but they were both equally uh, dangerous or safe in use. The thing that since transpired, of course, is if you burn a log of CCA in the fireplace, what you're left with is arsenic trioxide dust, which is not good. But um, basically, uh, that particular technology of making a powder arsenic trioxide was superseded, I would guess, mostly about 15, 20 years ago, with autoclaving to fix the arsenic trioxide ascorbate of some form, or if it were very arsenic. And um, that's a mo much more appropriate way to do it because you're now fixing it for you know, geological time, if you so choose, <coughs> rather than the, the oxide approach using the CCA. And it did go into other things. It's still used in fine glass, for example. Um, so there are legitimate uses for the arsenic. That was one patent. And another patent was for silencing and toilet puncture basement converters. Uh, basically, a bottle blown converter, and the way they do it is they push it, well, the toilet is plugged up because they're under the liquid metal bath. And so, the traditional way in a pierce smith was you ram a rod through the back of the toilet to open the toilet itself, which is just but to do that, you go through a ball valve, and of course, as you go through the valve, the compressed air comes out. It makes a terrible noise. So we came up with a, a gizmo that essentially had slid the, the silencer slid down the, the rod that we were using to punch, so that it sealed against the back of the two-year block and prevented the air coming out. Now, of course, it saved compressed air, but reduced the noise. And it was, it was used in one or two places on gas bay punches for a while, but um, it really didn't catch on. But even some of those some patents. A couple of other patents were used in sort of one off situation because they were developed for one off circumstance. Um, and I don't think they really need to elaborate on that. They were fun. I mean, but they all came out of a specific problem at the time. So the, uh, the, the Trier technology that was a that was a health and safety improvement was it? It was primarily a, a noise abatement thing. 
Um, were you involved in the development of uh, the refractory cooling technology, or was that before you got there? No, that was, that was basically Jerry Hatcher, but it wasn't. Uh, so that totally, totally challenged. You said Bert Wasman was a, was a mentor, was he? Uh, he was one of several I had over the, uh, I was fortunate enough to have over the years. And basically, it started with the inspiration of Jerry Hatcher himself, a remarkable man. Um, but I didn't have a lot of interaction with him as a young man. But uh, Bert Wasman was my immediate supervisor and followed closely by Emil Menager, who <coughs> was the son of one of the founders of uh, the N and S and C. But uh, Emil and Bert between them taught me the value of doing fundamental arithmetic uh, and uh, analyzing problems from the bottom up. And looking at alternative ways of solving the problem rather than just going with the first one that comes to mind. <clears throat> so from a technical point of view, they were both hugely valuable. And uh, valuable in terms of sticking to your guns. If you get an answer that says right is right, and left is left, well, that's the way it is. And it's up to the client to say, okay, I understand that's the way it is, but I choose to go this way. And then you say, okay, fine, that's your choice. But uh, you don't bend your answer to the client. And that, uh, that integrity, was drilled into us very early by Bert and Emma. And that's been a founding kind of principle behind it. And the growth of Hatch, I think, is being recognized for our integrity. Can you describe how computer technology has uh, affected the domain of metallurgy, and particularly your work on fluid mechanics or, over the years? Uh, there's two different parts of that question. In metallurgy, um, there have been huge developments in databases particularly around thin dynamics. Uh, a lot of work done by people like Art Belton and Chris Bale uh, over in Quebec. And they've done great work in bringing together huge, huge amount of empirical data into usable form for design purposes. Um, and uh, a lot of good work's been done in Europe as well. So there are several very strong databases. It would be impossible without the computer strength to so manipulate the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and flowing out of that, there are some very strong uh, modeling capabilities, whether it's Metzen or Aspen or others, that draw on those databases, which saved a huge amount of work, a huge amount of approximations, um, and hopefully resulted in On the fluid mechanics side, um, yeah, in the early days, Fluent, I guess, was the first program that really got used extensively in the metal field. And interestingly enough, I, I was an experimental fluid mechanics guy. We did a lot of measurement of stuff out in the field in particular. And the people who were using computers would bring you these printouts of flows. You look Say it's not right. You know, go back and check your boundary conditions typically. Uh, or go in the field and measure it and convince me that what you've got is wrong. Right. Because uh, it's it's very easy to fall into the trap that if you that the model is right. And in the early days it wasn't always. And you get into endless loops which would keep you in a lot of trouble. Um, they've improved from capability around combustion, around multi-fluid uh, multi systems, around solid fluid gas mixtures is amazing. But in some areas they still will only give you guidance as to what is right and what is wrong, and guidance towards your design. And often you come back to, does it look like it should look like that? Because ultimately you know where you're going to get your cycles and the flow. You know where stuff's going to settle. But it's a matter of if you can demonstrate that with the model and you can use the model for the next step, whatever that may be. So they're very useful, but they're not 100% of the answer. I'm just curious about the fact database. How, how is the information gathered uh, over time for that system? You'd have to check with something like that, but I, 
basically it's hard work. I mean, a lot of people do a lot of experimental work over a lot of period, a long period, and it has to be digitized into a consistent format and uh, fit within a framework that's searchable in their system. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the, the strength of the fact that you can search. I understand that uh, Hatch is a sensor division. I was wondering how sensor technology has uh, changed metallurgical operations over time. I wouldn't say we have a sensor division. We have a control and automation division. That's it. Um, where we rely on sensors provided by other people to give us an electrical signal that we then manipulate. Although, interestingly enough, sensors are actually the weak point in the whole of the control of the metallurgical field. Because the, it's a, a very, very rigorous application. High temperatures, high pressures, high acidity, um, and uh, physical abuse, uh, abrasion, corrosion. So sensors have a very hard time in our business. Um, but having said that, yes, we do have a, a big control and automation division. Um, and, you know, they're, they're getting into AI and they're getting into big data uh, analysis. And it's very much the direction of the future. The way mines are going now is with RFID tags on everybody and everything uh, being tracked with in, in situ um, Wi Fi systems in the mine. So, up you know, 1500 miles away, you can track exactly what's going on in real time. And uh, that's made a huge difference where it's been uh, applied in productivity. How has that affected what the operator does uh, over the time that you've, you've been in the industry? You really have a different caliber of operator. Uh, that job can be quite different. Uh, in fact, you know, if you're moving into remote mining, you go sitting at a desk like this, and you know, then watching screens and pushing buttons. And when you think of what Rio Tinto and BHP have done, I mean, they are they are running a fleet of autonomous trucks in Western Australia, uh, 1,500 miles from the control center, uh, and trucks are loading trains and the trains have no drivers and they're running down to the port. I mean, you know, it's, it's a different game, but on the other hand, those are the, the heavyweight majors, they've got huge capital budgets, and they've got huge operations. So it is a different scale, but you know, what starts pioneered by them, 20 years is going to be throughout the industry, with any luck. Mm -hmm. Because there are two drivers, really, one is safety and the other is productivity. If you have nobody in the mine, it's a lot safer than having somebody down there. Now, maintenance, we're always going to have to have people around for maintenance. But if you can make, bring the equipment up remotely, do it up on the surface, fantastic. That's interesting. Now, I'm interested in how uh, Hatch acquired the coil box from Stelco and, uh, and what it did with it, and sort of generally what Hatch, the, the role Hatch has in selling technology. Uh, okay, so it's, coil box is a very good, good example. Um, in the early 90s, Stolco was going into bankruptcy again. And uh, so we bought directly from them a company called Steltech, which was their vehicle for selling proprietary technology that they had developed over a long time. And within that, uh, there was a coil box, there was something called a macro lecture, there was something which a uh, macro lecture is a quality thing, the hinge ladle makes energy conservation thing. They were actually selling in China these days. But the, the, and there were two or three other things. But the, uh, the key thing is they came with the technology license, with the package, with the people who could support it. Uh, and we brought them in as a group. Now, uh, at that point, they had sold roughly 30 of the boxes around the world over the previous 15 years, 20 years maybe. Um, and in the subsequent 25 years, we've sold another 50, give or take. Now, the business model has changed a little over the years because uh, patents primarily and things. But the um, original business model was that Stealth Tech licensed the coil box technology to all the major mill builders. 
and so we would uh, collect a license fee, we would do a training uh, a fee and uh, maintenance fees. <coughs> and uh, the mill builders would actually sell it as well. Subsequently, we have actually got into supplying it directly, um, and we've done several of those, but uh, we found it more flexible, again, to work with the, road, uh, the mill builders that uh, will continue to work with us. Others have just taken what they've learned over the years because the bands are with them and gone and they do it themselves. But we've continued to improve the coil box over the years. And the, the most obvious thing is in the early days, you had a mandrel sitting in the middle and you coil a steel bar, a transfer bar around the mandrel. Well, over the years, we, we actually came up with a mechanism so you don't need a mandrel, uh, which, of course, simplifies the manufacture and the operation. But otherwise, uh, the, the improvements over time have been around ease of maintenance. And more importantly, we found is that when you take a mill down for maintenance, typically you work two or three days, you don't work longer than that. To change out a coil box or do some major work in a coil box, it's a couple of weeks. So we've actually changed how we do things and how it's designed so you can do an incremental upgrade in several pieces over time. And those are the kinds of things that we've kept tweaking, tweaking, tweaking to keep, keep knocking, if you like, and keep in the game. And uh, the role we, we fulfill now has changed. We occasionally supply a box, but not often. It's much more now maintenance, upgrading, auditing. Uh, we run conferences for call box users where we exchange information about performance and operations. So that's how we've done it. And that's, uh, you know, the last 25 years, that's kind of evolved. Now, when you began your career, uh, this was the period when uh, environmental le uh, legislation was starting to come to, to play. Um, can you describe how uh, that process is affected by your work at Hatch? Well, as I indicated earlier, a lot of my early work was driven by the environmental legislation around air pollution control and noise control. For that. Um, beyond that, I guess like environmental impact assessments were also driven by legislation. Beyond that, really, the whole evolution of the metallurgical industry over the last 25 years has been driven initially by environment, but more recently by productivity. But the, the great strength we've had at Hatch is that because we've got a core of process engineers, um, you could fix both simultaneously. You could change the process to reduce the environmental issues as well as increase the and that's where things like the, the water cooled furnaces come in, where you intensify processes. And where our autoclave technology comes in as well. Um, again, intensifying the process. Can you discuss your work with the uh, CanMet Clean Mining Initiative Advisory Board? Uh, okay, CanMet established the Clean Mining Initiative probably seven or eight years ago. Um, as a way of, of bundling a whole bunch of the work they were doing in the minerals laboratories um, around clean mining, which means different things to different people and covers a whole bunch of stuff. But, you know, uh, clean up and clean up, you've got reclaiming tailings, uh, better energy use, underground, hybrid equipment, a whole, a whole range of good initiatives around reducing environmental footprint mining operations, more mining than metallurgy in that case. Um, and as a, an activity, they established uh, an external industry base advisory board. And we weren't all industry. We had uh, a couple of NGOs there. We had uh, a couple of university people as well. We had SPTC there. That was a large department. So it was a fairly broad-based advisory group that just if you like, was a sanity check on what they were doing. We didn't get into details of all the programs, but we looked at the distribution of what we were doing, of what they were doing. Uh, we told them about other stuff that was going on that maybe they should have been aware of, were aware of, but 
hadn't really connected with. So it was a strictly uh, an advisory. It wasn't uh, a line of function in any sense. And I guess the Green Clean Mining Initiative as such has kind of wound down as far as I'm aware. They switched a lot of the funding into their rare earth initiative, which is a big initiative. Are there any uh, particularly dysfunctional jobs or organizations that you've uh, that you've worked on with? Um, I've never worked in a dysfunctional organization. I've certainly worked with dysfunctional clients. No, that's not quite true. With dysfunctional project teams on the client side, and uh, I don't think I should go into detail. What are some some of the uh, major challenges that you face in your work? Um, there, there are two different kinds. One is technology supply is so incredibly fast that it's really, really hard to keep up with what's going on, particularly if you're interested in a range of uh, matters. Um, the other challenge really is just around uh, the fundamentals. I haven't really been in the fundamental business for business side. Um, so you lose touch with the fundamentals. I think you keep uh, an instinct, should we say. If stuff doesn't look right, it probably is. But the, the other thing I find is very hard is keeping track of who is who in the zoo. Um, companies keep changing, buying, selling, switching, switching, expanding, contracting. So the only way I can keep track of anything these days is the original name of the mine. If it's the Dickinson mine, I'm not sure if Dome owns it, if Placer owns it, if Gold Corp owns it, but I know the Dickinson mine, where it is, and what they used to do, and what they are doing. So uh, keeping track of who's who in the zoo is really hard. But you've got to do what you can do. Google helps. What's uh, the most difficult project that you've worked on? I think the most difficult project I worked on was. We were, we were trying to make uh, steel powder uh, for the parts manufacturers in the automotive business. And uh, it had been done at some scale by other people. But we were trying to do it at a scale that was about seven times the size of anybody else in the world at the time. And there had been several failures uh, in Europe in particular. People weren't able to get this thing. And we did, we did a, a pilot, and uh, that, the pilot, of course, was difficult because you know, you're pouring liquid steel, and in fact, you couldn't have liquid steel, you use liquid iron instead, and of course, you then had to compensate for the differences. And, you know, we, we wanted the thing to run for an hour and a half of heat, and but because of the metal supply, we could only run for three minutes, so we had to try and compensate for that. <coughs> And the test work was relatively successful. It was made of the quality that it was expected, and a lot of things behaved the way that we expected to. But then once we got into the full-scale production, we found we were building huge stalactites of steel inside the operating vessel. And the fluid mechanics didn't indicate why it was happening. And the way the jets were going didn't explain it. And we figured out eventually that it was the slopping tank at the bottom of the water carrying the steel powder I was partly responsible. So it took us several different uh, attempts, long, long nights, uh, to get that thing working properly. And uh, that, was, that was a technically a really hard one because it was well beyond any analytical Testing in the full scale was both expensive and dangerous, but we got it done. And now they make a uh, fine product and uh, fill the rest. What's the uh, your fondest memory that relates to your work? My fondest memory is really around people. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with some wonderful people in all over the world, um, and. It's interesting how you can go into some really unpleasant cultures 
and still find me working with some really special people. And you know, I, I would say, no matter what country I've been in, there's always been really special people. Um, so most of my fondest memories are around that. And interesting enough, one little thing that uh, really made me feel uh, proud was when I came into the office one day in Chile and somebody addressed me as Don Chris and instead of uh, Don Chris or Boss or Mr. Twain or whatever. And to me that was a, a mark of respect that I didn't expect and uh, I was really very pleased about that. So it's these silly little things that sometimes make a difference. Can you tell us about your role in, uh, in METSOC and CIM? Okay, well, that's been a long time. When I was a young engineer, I was approached uh, out of the blue to uh, join the Montferris Pyro Committee of METSO. And their role basically was once a year to organize a conference, uh, sorry, a symposium within the conference of metal arts. And so I, I worked with them for some years, and by 1890, I was actually organizing the symposium and uh, became chairman. As chairman of the group, you sit on the board of Metsoc. Um, so that one, one thing led to another, and uh, about three or four years later, I became president of Metsoc. And we had some very successful conference of metallurgists. Uh, and then I stepped down, I'd done my time. And um, it was Canada's turn to host the Copper series of conferences, uh, which typically was rotated every four years between uh, Chile, U.S., Canada, and uh, maybe not well, Japan, they got a lot later. But um, it was rotated Chile, U.S., Canada, and it had been put together by Carlos Diaz and uh, Phil Bagley and others. And it had been Carlos and so too. So because I was a Metsoc, was the partner, uh, it wasn't CIM. So I was asked if I would chair this thing on behalf of the Canadian team. So I was happy to. We had a very successful conference here in Toronto. Um, and at the celebratory dinner, um, I wound up sitting next to the president of CIM, who had been invited. And uh, we got a chat, and obviously he had seen the success of the conference, so he asked me to get involved in the CIM itself. So I did. And I guess that one thing leads to another. And uh, I guess by 2010, um, I became president of the CIA, um, which was a hugely rewarding experience. And I guess overall, I've probably done 10 years now on the council of CIA. Uh, for the last four or five years, responsible for governance and uh, involved in the whole side. Which is fine. I mean, they're, they're a really fantastic group of people, and uh, it's been a very rewarding experience. And again, coming back to the kinds of people you meet, the volunteers in our business are, are very special people. How present or absent were uh, women in your workplace? Um, in the early days, they were largely absent. These days, well, except for obviously support staff. These days, I would say half of our young engineers are women. Uh, I'm speaking passionately, I'm not talking about the rest of the industry, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's pretty much the same in many other engineering companies. Uh, in our senior ranks, it's not that good. Uh, I guess 10% if we're lucky in senior management. Maybe 15, but I would doubt it. Were there any uh social problems uh, in, in your line of work? Uh, alcohol, drug abuse, those sorts of things? Not that I'm aware of. Um, you know, professional organization tends to be a pretty straight laced bunch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure, sure we had alcoholic drugs. I should be had alcoholic stuff, for sure. Uh, provided they did their job, they got the support they needed, and some survived and some didn't. And some 
The professional environment is a little different from a manufacturing facility or somebody actually testing drug testing people and sign up for them to come in and run this. No, it hasn't been an issue. You've already uh, mentioned some of your mentors. Is there anything more that you, you'd like to say about that? For me, it is very important to have somebody you can talk to about stuff that uh, gets in the way of achieving what you're trying to do. And it can't be your line manager. It doesn't have to be inside the company either. Um, and in fact, that's one of the things I found most satisfying over the last few years is that I've uh, there's simply got two generations of the folks that I've mentored personally. Um, whether useful or not, only they can tell you. I find it rewarding to think you help a lot of people. What are the most important lessons you've learned over your career? Um, two, really. And maybe this is a function of consulting, but I don't think so. One, one is to listen. It's particularly if you're in a role where you're expected to be problem solving, you can't come with a presupposed answer or a pre assumed a lot of folks do, and they need a lot of management consultants, for example, have a template, and this is what you've got to do. Um, so you've got to listen. And the other thing I think is to, uh, is to show respect. Um, everybody you deal with um, is likely doing their best in the circumstance. And you know, they may not have the skills they need, they may not have had the training they should have had, they could have had some kind of disaster at home, we don't know about. So irrespective of how odd behavior can be or how off the wall people can be on occasion, you have to treat them with respect. And um, you get in life what you give. What are you proudest of in life? I would say um, my family. Five years, very happily. Uh, I've got four kids, five grandkids, do the same thing. Um, and they're a wonderful bunch, and I'm very proud of them. My wife takes me up to the grave with them. For sure. Um, on the professional side, I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the way Hatch has grown. And obviously, I can't take more than a wee bit of credit, but it was an incredible team that built Hatch through the growth period. Led by Ron Morrow, who was a remarkable man. Um, well, of course, Jerry Hatch set the foundation for the first 25 years um, of high ethics, high technical competence, and listen to the client. With those three things, we thought you can't go wrong. And Ron really maintained that. And Kurt Strobel, when he came in after Ron, also worked hard to maintain that. And he had a really hard period because our growth was explosive through the early 2000s. And when you have explosive growth, you're bringing in people from all over the place. And they come with all kinds of baggage, and all kinds of other companies, ways of doing things. And you don't have a lot of time to try and reorient them because you've got projects to build. And both Ron and Kurt really worked hard at that. And uh, John B. King, our current president, has picked up the mantle. Um, so being part of a team that has propagated that way of seeing the world, I think, is one of my proudest accomplishments. What do you believe to be your biggest contribution to the field of metallurgy? The field of metallurgy, no. <laughs> to helping build a company, um, as I've described, part of the team that uh, went in a lot, of, a lot of different directions over the years. Uh, because we were transformed from essentially a regional group in North America to a global group. And um, personally, I guess I'm, I'm proudest of the, the really outstanding individual who are still in Hatch that I hired and worked for them for many years. Um, and actually some of the outstanding individuals who worked for other people who I hired and trained and uh, went on to 
creating the postures. That's going to happen. So we're at an hour and five minutes. So do you mind answering a few more questions? No, no, at all. Well, I'd be really interested to hear about your uh, experience in China and um, your views on the the place of China, the growing place of China in uh, mining and metallurgy. Well, China is a, a unique development in history that not a lot of people. Um, as we sit now, they currently produce half the world's steel, so obviously they are completely dominant. They're pretty near half the world's copper, pretty near half the world's zinc, pretty near half the world's aluminum. So, in, and of course, they're ninety-five percent of the rare earths, and they're eighty percent plus of the world's tungsten. So, they are without a doubt controlling the world's metallurgical markets. And uh, you know, for communists to be rank opportunistic, capitalist uh, monopolists is surprising. Um, and they will continue to dominate because they're continuing to grow. I mean, they've, they've moved four or five hundred million people to the cities. They plan on moving another three hundred over the next 10, 15 years. Ten years. Um, when you're building cities, you're using a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, a lot of copper, a lot of all the things that minerals produce. And so the metallurgical business is going to be driven by their evolution, whether we like it or not. And North America uh, will grow 1 or 2%. Europe will grow 1 or 2% if we're lucky. Africa may start to grow too. And if they do, that's going to put even more pressure on things. And interestingly, uh, because of the downturn we're in now, the plants to supply that aren't being built because of the time lag it takes. It takes 20 years to go from discovery to an operating mine on average. Which is why our, system, our, our business is so cyclical. Anyhow, having said that, um, our journey in China has been really interesting. Um, we, we work for farms building stuff inside China, of which there aren't too many anymore, the metallurgical mining stuff. But we did Rio Gentil's first plant in China, a metallurgical powder plant. We did Anglo American's first mine in China, uh, which was a huge quarry that supplies all of Shanghai. <clears throat> and we've so we've, we've built for farm as well. We set up a procurement hub there for capital goods uh, for our projects around the world because we have to. Um, and that's been very successful. We ship hundreds of millions of dollars through that around the world over a decade. Um, we do M and A consulting into China at full plant uh, clients both looking in and looking out. We do a lot of market studies for people trying to figure out what's happening in China. We work for the Chinese invested outside China, whether it's Potash in Saskatchewan or Albumina in Australia, uh, or highways in Algeria, actually. Um, so we, we, we work on that dimension as well. And more recently, we've started doing, well, we've always shipped technology packages into China, particularly the coil boxes we were talking about earlier. We've probably got, I would guess, 15 of them in China. And uh, then more recently, we've started doing major projects for the Chinese inside China because we have our own Class A design license in the metallurgical business that allows us to do a plant of any scale anywhere in China. And in metallurgy, we're the only foreign consultant that has that license. So it's been, it's been an interesting journey of the 12 years I've been involved. I think uh, it's going to be an interesting journey over the next 12 years. And I expect uh, our growth there to be quite substantial. Are Chinese companies starting to enter the field of engineering process development uh, to the extent that they compete with Hatch? Uh, they are definitely in the field. Um, and in some fields, they're already ahead of the West. I mean, in glass furnaces, for example, they that operate much higher intensity blast furnaces at larger scale than anybody. Uh, so there's not much we can learn there. But on the other hand, we have been able to take a hatch technology around measuring in situ 
the depth of the blast furnace lining while the blast furnace is operating. Um, so you know, we are working for those same blast furnaces with technology about In lead, uh, there's been no process development in the West for 20, 25 years, and they have been doing some really interesting stuff. Um, Zinc less so, but there hasn't been much built in Zinc for a long time. Um, other metals, I mean, rare earth, for example, they, they are the world leaders. Magnesium, they're decades behind. In fact, they're building a, a modern magnesium plant for them right now. Um, that plant is one that we moved from Beckencore here in, in Canada, and it was built 30 years ago. So, you know, they're still a long way behind magnesium. Aluminum, they're catching up with the West. I mean, they bought a lot of Western technology, they copied some technology, um, and they're slowly creeping up on us because they have incredible analytical technical capabilities. And uh, a lot of the problem solving with something like a copper comes back to your capacity to analyze what's actually going on in the copper. And they've got five more, far, far more firepower focused on that kind of stuff than the whole of the West put together. So, yeah, well, they'll catch us. Um, it's, it's, it'll be a few years yet. Do you support the idea of a, of a golden age within Canadian metallurgy that has come to an end with the decline of research and development, or, or does that seem too pessimistic to you? No, I think, I think that's possibly real, and there are several drivers, uh, depending on how you classify the golden age. I mean, Canada was always doing interesting stuff. Go back to the founding of International Nickel in 1905 or you know, they were doing you know, smelting nickel, developing carbonyl, doing all kinds of stuff over a long period. Now, some of that was in England, some in the States, some of it here. Um, uranium processing was developed here during, during the war. Um, pitching process for magnesium was developed here. So there's a long history. So when you want to start the golden period back then, or you know, in the 50s and 60s, and early 70s is, is, is a new point. Certainly in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we were beneficiaries of several things. Uh, when England went in the toilet, well, Britain went in the toilet in the 60s, we got a really strong wave of very high quality academics, whether it was uh, Alex McLean, Two or three came to U of T. Uh, several went to McGill, Blackwell, and Guthrie. And then that was followed very closely by Pinochet's upheaval in Chile. And we got a wave of Chilean academics in the metallurgical field or chemical engineering. And now we're talking Carlos Diaz uh, and uh, René de Villa and several others really high caliber Chilean metallurgists came. And uh, they all became senior people, whether it was Carlos Lanoff, the thing called, whether it was Alfonso Grau at QIT, Rio Tinto. It all added to us. Stop this for a second. <clears throat> so, uh, the, the, the one thing was these waves of immigrants that followed them by 68, we got the checks. And now they brought more uh, what I call real engineers in the mechanics and the civils and the structures um, rather than uh, metallurgical. Although there was some metallurgical came uh, from the, the Polish upheavals in the, in the late 50s. So, I mean, we've been the beneficiaries of European education systems. Uh, we got quite a few draft dodgers in the early years of the Vietnam War as well. And then, um, so that was, that was, if you like, fueling what you might want to call the golden age. I guess if we're going to characterize it as a period that ended, I think the, the ending came 
with the, the various downturns that started to flush out the in-house R&D groups, and then more recently the foreign ownership that has absolutely dominated our business. As I said earlier, we've only got a couple of gold companies, uh, major gold companies, and tech are the only not foreign owned majors in the, in the country. And they will put their R&D money typically they see it as most effective with them. Rio likes to put their money in Australia. Valor uh, likes to put their money in Brazil. Uh, Encore, I'm not sure where they put their money. They're primary traders of the logical company. Uh, so, you know, the, the prominence of R&D effort in Canada has really suffered. Folks like Ipsco still do interesting work on the cold weather line pipe. Uh, but you know, this is a material science thing now, rather than a core process construction. And of course, there's lots of material uh, stuff being done in the universities around nanomaterials. Now, you know, from my point of view, uh, I, I don't really see that as part of the processing. I see that much more as communication reaction in some ways, because you know, they're precipitating these things out. Whether you want it to be material science, metallurgy is a new point. And there is a lot of that happening. And uh, heavy funding for it, which is good. But something's got to make primary materials before you can start doing fancy stuff with highly purified materials. I'd like to ask about that. I mean, on the academic side, there's certainly been a shift uh, from metallurgy towards material science. Do you think? That, that that represents some more profound shift in, in, in what people are, are making things out of, how things are being designed, the composite materials and nanomaterials and sorts of things? Um, yes, there are a lot of interesting activities in both nanomaterials and composite materials, for good reason. Um, it's perceived as, you know, a, a whole growth area for downstream manufacturing. And also, you know, underpinning technologies for all kinds of exotic sensors, and, you know, bio sensors in particular, you know, the microfluidics and mechatronics, and all these evolving disciplines that are at a micro scale. Um, I'm afraid I grew up at a macro scale, and so a lot of it is rather beyond me. But the, the, the key thing I keep coming back to is if you want highly purified metals to do your good stuff with, someone's going to make it. And that's where we're coming from, where I've been coming from anyway. Overall in the metals in this industry, has the, has the pace of innovation slowed in recent years? Very much so. Because uh, two things, I guess. Um, one is the, the fact that the R&D is not being driven in the same way operating companies. Um, and the second is that there's a value of death in the innovation business. I mean, if you look at what innovation is all about, you've got research is turning money into ideas, and you've got innovation is turning ideas into money. Um, they're both long-term projects. So you know, the innovation step can be 15 or 20 years in our business. And the key thing is that if you've got a 15 to 20 year time frame before you get an idea to a commercial application, and I don't care if it's a gas cleaning technology or it's a new way of making nickel or if it's a cleaning technology, by the time you've gone through lab tests, pilot tests, demonstration tests, and all the things that happen in between, it's a 15 to 20 year process. How do you reconcile that with the three to five years that VC funds want to get their money out? And then how do you reconcile that with the three month quarterly reporting of a public company? And that's really hard. And the other thing that's really hard is the fact that um, we're a very capital intensive business in the metallurgical side. And people like to see what they're getting into. So there's this rush to the second. 
And that means you've got to have somebody willing to take the risk first time up. And so they've got to have fortitude, courage. You've got to have a, a champion inside the company that's going to fight to the tooth and nail over a long period of time. Because you're going to have changes of ownership, you're going to have business cycles. And in a 20 year period, you've got two or three business cycles. And probably a couple of changes of ownership. Um, you're going to have all kinds of team changes. Every time you go from one phase to another to another, you get a different team, often. So one way or another, getting something driven all the way through to commercial application is hard. And uh, that's why, at this point, the only people that seem to have stuck to their guns and continue to do it are PHP uh, and Rivkin, to, to a lesser extent, are cold. Um, because You've got to have your long time frames and you've got to have the balance sheet to do it. So um, that to me is one of the big problems we're facing. The thing I'd like to see, and uh, I don't know why this has to happen, is that we've got the flow through shares as a way of raising money in the mining sector, in the exploration sector, which has about the same success rate as the innovation sector. Why we can't have flow through shares in the innovation slice of the piece, I don't know. Uh, and it's a message that I keep telling to anybody who will listen that um, getting tax changes is a pretty significant challenge. You mentioned that Hatch uh, fo uh, followed Falcon Bridge into the Dominican Republic uh, that was laterite oil uh, ores for, for nickel. I'm curious about this. Uh, shift on the part of the mining industry towards you know, lower grade ores over time. Have you experienced that and, and can, you, can you explain it? Uh, the easy way to explain it is the easy stuff's been found, the good stuff. But the partly um, in nickel in particular, that's actually the way the reserves stack up. There is very little sulfide nickel that is economically extractable now. And so the swing has been to lateral. And, you know, the really rich laterites, I mean, laterite tends to be a surface deposit anyway, so it's been pretty easy to find the rich ones. And laterites are all over the tropics. I mean, they're well known, and they're very rich ones, you know, in places like Cuba, New Caledonia, um, Dominican Republic. But um, you then get into the whole issue of uh, infrastructure costs, political stability, and other things that drive you into lower and lower grades. On top of that, technology allows you to get at lower and lower grades uh, economically. And this has evolved pretty dramatically over the last 15, 20 years. Um, you know, H power is now a viable laterite technology. It's had its ups and downs over the last 20 years. Um, electric foam smelting, of course, laterites is quite appropriate. That comes back to the actual input. So um, that's nickel. Uh, iron ore. Iron ore grade has never been an issue. Iron ore is a, essentially a logistics cost. You know, when you elaborate a trench, you've got stuff you dig out of the ground and you ship or put right in the glass rooms. In Western Australia, you know, it comes out of half the grade, so they've got to fix it. Um, so one way or another, uh, iron ore is just a logistics issue. So, um, copper, it's a different set of equations. I mean, they're typically, um, you've got the sulfides and the oxides again. Uh, but the waste dumps and the oxides, you know, you can trickle out over long periods of time with acetylation. It's a simple process. Well, it's a huge. So, it, it does very much depend on the metal, why you're going to work. Gold, you've got no choice. There's only low grade gold left. If you find high grade, you go for it. Mm. So it depends on the metal. And political circumstance in the country you find it. Anything else uh, you'd like to add? No, except I think it's a very exciting project collecting you know, many memories from people like myself. Yeah, yeah.
I'm uh, going to speak to Bert Wasserman to tomorrow. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, you know, under Mississauga. Okay. What well, if you can corral Kurt Strobel as well? That would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm.